Alright, so in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, we see here a lot about King Jehoshaphat. And we're going to focus on King Jehoshaphat quite a bit this morning. King Jehoshaphat was a king in, 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 of Judah. This was after the, you know, the, the nation of Israel split into the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah. And um, King Jehoshaphat was a king. And we're going to see, let's look at a little bit of what we've read about him here. I'll recap just real quickly. Look at verse number 3 of 2 Chronicles 17. Verse number 3 says, And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the first ways of his father David, and sought not unto Balaam. Of course, Balaam is, is, a, is a plural form of Baal, which is just false gods. You know, if you remember, as you read through the book of Kings and and Chronicles, you read about these kings, and some of them walked in the ways of God, they followed the Lord, they did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and other people, they worshipped false gods, they worshipped Baal, they worshipped Baalim, they'd set up the groves, and they'd set up all these altars, and they'd do all this wickedness. So Jehoshaphat says, he walked in the ways of his father David. Now, not many of the kings were regarded as following in the ways of David. They'll, they'll, they'll liken... People always likened up to people who, who lived before them. They'll say he did like the way of his father, and it might be his immediate ancestors, immediate father. And, um, you know, they might have been a good guy, but they still had all these other problems. But they were still a pretty good king. They were pretty righteous. Jehoshaphat, he says here, he walked in the ways of his father David and sought not unto Baal. Look at verse number four. It says, but sought to the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. See, at this time, Israel was doing very wickedly. They were not following the Lord. They were worshiping false gods. But Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, said, Nope, we're going to obey the Lord. We're going to follow. So he says, he walked in his commandments. Verse 5, Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presents, and he had riches and honor and abundance. So, you know, he's lifted up. God, God's blessing him here. For, for obeying and following the Lord. And it says in verse 6, and his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. So it wasn't just lifted up in pride, right? If our heart gets lifted up because of our wealth and our abundance as a proud attitude, that's evil, that's wicked, that's bad, that's wrong. But it says here that his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord, which is the way that we want our hearts to be lifted up. Not lifted up in pride, but lifted up in God's ways, lifted up in following the Lord. That's the type of heart that we should have. That's the type of heart that... Jehoshaphat had says, moreover, he took away the high places and groves out of Judah. This is something that not many of the kings did. Oftentimes, even when they followed the Lord, they still left the high places. They left the groves. You know, they didn't bother taking them down. Jehoshaphat took care of that. Jump down to verse number nine. It says, he also did this. It, it lists off all these Levites that that are that are. Um, that were sent out by Jehoshaphat. Verse 9 says, And they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them and went about throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the land that were round about Judah so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. So not only is Jehoshaphat following the ways of the Lord, he's saying, okay, now we're going to send the Levites out and you're going to teach the people. Like just just." Teach the general population about the Lord. Bring the law. Bring the Bible. Bring God's word and teach this people. I mean, can you imagine if Barack Obama were to say, you know, we are a Christian nation. We're going to follow Jesus Christ. And he's going to create this administration. He's going to send people out to preach the Bible to the regular person. Can you imagine if he did that? Wow. How far removed are we from somebody like Jehoshaphat being in charge? Jehoshaphat was a man of God. And, and I'm pointing this out, you know, we're going to look into a little bit of, of Jehoshaphat's life. Jehoshaphat was, I'm pointing all this out because Jehoshaphat was a very good king. He was a very godly king in, the, in this line of the kings of Judah. Um, he looks like he's a great guy according to everything that we read here. And, and he was. Flip over to 1 Kings chapter 22. We're going to see... We're going to see some problems that come up with King Jehoshaphat and the ramifications of, of, one, of one thing in particular that, that he did. He basically ended up having, 
hanging around with the wrong crowd or having the wrong friends. And that's, that's what I'm preaching about this morning. So if you want to know where I'm going with this, my sermon is titled, Having the Wrong Friends. And we see here, Jehoshaphat is a man of God, right? He's a good Christian. He's a good, godly man. He's, a, he's following the Lord with his heart. He's lifted up in the ways of the Lord. He's doing all these things. And, um, and he's a good guy, right? But we're going to see one of the problems he had. 1 Kings chapter 22. And we're going to look at verse number 41 of 1 Kings 22. Because, you know, in, in the book of Chron 1 and 2 Chronicles, you get a lot of the same stories that are in 1 and 2 Kings. Because it's just kind of a repeat um, of the events. Now, you get a lot more details looking at the different uh, renditions of the, of the stories, the different recordings. But... Um, in 1 Kings 22, look at verse number 44, 41, excuse me. 1 Kings 22, verse number 41, the Bible says, And Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was 30 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shilai. And he walked in all the ways of Asa, his father. He turned not aside from it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for the people offered and burnt incense yet in the high places. And Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And the remnant of the Sodomites which remained in the days of his father Asa he took out of the land. So again, we see here... Just more, more evidence showing that Jehoshaphat was a good king. He, it says that he, he walked in all the ways of Asa's father. He turned not aside from doing it and doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So he did, he walked in the ways of God. And not only that, it says he took out the remnant of the Sodomites. So King Asa was his father and, and he started this, but there was still... And, and, and there's only a few kings that did this as well. And this is a positive thing, mind you. This is not a negative thing. As the culture today would probably have you think that getting rid of the queers and getting them out of our land and just getting them out of here would be some horrible thing. And, oh, I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you used that word. Well, look, these stinking faggots need to get out of here. If we had a godly nation, these sodomites, which, yeah, faggot is another name for a sodomite. Amen. Or a queer. They need to get out of here. And if we had a godly nation and a godly ruler, they would get the remnant. Or the, now it's not even a remnant. See, back then it was just a remnant. He just got rid of them all together and just said, you guys are not allowed in here. You're wicked. You're perverted. You're predators. You prey on those that can't help themselves. And you recruit people into your wicked lifestyle. We're going to get rid of you. And that's not what... Um, that's not what we're doing today, and it's not even a remnant anymore. It's growing, and people have been brainwashed into thinking that this is some acceptable lifestyle when it's abominable and wickedness in the eyes of the Lord, and God put the death penalty on lying with man as he'd lie with a woman. And that is, that is wickedness, and see, again, Jehoshaphat was a great, a great man of God and a great king, and even mentions that here, that, oh yeah, and by the way, the son, he got them out of the land. Because they're nothing but a plague and a cancer to your society to have a group of people, wicked people like that, allowed to just march up and down your streets flaunting their wickedness and their perversion and their sin against God. Joshua was a great king. He followed the Lord, but he did have this one distinct problem, and he made friends with a wicked king. That king was King Ahab. We're going to look a little bit about King Ahab here. If you're in uh, chapter 22 of 1 Kings, flip back to chapter 16. We're going to see a few highlights of the wickedness of King Ahab. We're not going to focus too much time on him. But if you're in um, 22, flip back to chapter 16. We're going to look at verse number 29 of 1 Kings 16. It says, And in the 30 and 8th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab the son of Amri to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Amri, reigned over Israel and Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, 
above all that were before him. So the Bible's saying right there that, that up until Ahab, he says, Ahab did more wickedness and more evil than all of the other kings of Israel that were before him. That's a pretty bold statement because there was a lot of people who had done wickedness before him. But Ahab's taken the cake up to this point in their existence. Look at verse number 31. It says, And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Eth Baal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So he sets up this altar to Baal. He sets up this false god and, and basically is getting all the people to sin. If you remember, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he's often referred to when the wicked kings do wickedly. As, as people who done, you know, as, the, as Jeroboam had done. Jeroboam made the, the calves in Dan, and um, I forget where the other one now escapes me, but um, he made these golden calves so that people would not go down to Jerusalem to worship. Girls, stop right now. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, did all kinds of wickedness. And it says that Ahab did even more than he did. And he set up Baal, and he did all his work, and he, and he married a wicked woman, Jezebel. And it's Ahab's wicked wife that had Naboth killed. If you flip over to chapter 21 now of 1 Kings, chapter 21, we're going to see just real, just a couple verses on, um, on this man Naboth. Naboth had a, had a vineyard next to Ahab's. See, they had, they had a, the parcel of ground, they had land, they had their property was next to each other. And Ahab looks and covets Naboth's property, and he wants it. And he's like, oh, this would go well with the rest of my field and my vineyards and my stuff. I want that property. So he approaches him, and he asks him to buy it. And Naboth is like, no, you know, the Lord forbid it me because you can't just, he's like, this is the, the inheritance that God has given me. I can't just sell it unto you. And he didn't want to do it. So Ahab's upset, and his wife, Jezebel, um, basically it's like, oh, why are you sad? Hey, you're the king. And she's like, don't worry about this. I'll take care of this for you. Mm -hmm. So she, she writes a letter in the king's name and stamps it with the king's stamp and, and sends off and has other worshipers of Baal, other wicked men, to bring up a false accusation against Naboth. And Naboth is killed. And, and because they have him stoned, they just lie about him and they kill him. And um, as soon as that happens, then Ahab goes and he takes the property. And he just basically just steals it. Look at um, chapter, you're in chapter 21, look at verse 25. It says, But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things, as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before our children. Ahab is a very wicked person. He's a very wicked king. And he started his reign in the days of Asa, which was Jehoshaphat's father. Asa was, so just to get this, make sure everyone's on the same page. Ahab is the king of Israel. Asa was the king of Judah. His son Jehoshaphat took over being king when Asa died. And during this time, Ahab was king of Israel during Asa's reign, and then also during Jehoshaphat's reign. So Jehoshaphat takes over the kingdom of Judah. This is after Ahab has already been around for a while. He's already done a lot of wicked things. Okay, it's not unknown the wickedness of Ahab, that he built these altars to Baal, that he's worshiping and serving false gods. This is the same guy, Ahab, that Jehoshaphat took upon himself to go down and see and make friends with. You're in 1 Kings 21, just flip over to chapter 22. Chapter 22, we're going to see here a story then of, of Jehoshaphat and where he makes friends with Ahab and helps him out in battle. Verse, uh, look at verse number 2 of chapter 22. It says, And it came to pass in the third year 
that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Now, what we can see from scripture here is that Jehoshaphat basically took upon himself to go down to the king of Israel. It doesn't say he was called or anything like that. It says Jehoshaphat came down to the king of Israel. And it says in verse 3, And the king of Israel said unto his servant, so he's not talking to Jehoshaphat, he says, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he's basically saying, look, the Syrians are control Ramoth. They're in control of the city, and don't we know, I mean, this is our city. We need to go take it back from them. This belonged to us. So he's talking to his own servants and saying, hey, we need to go to war against this king of Syria so that we can get our city back. This belongs to us. So not, and then he turns it to Jehoshaphat, verse 4, it says, And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. So he says, Yeah, I'll go with you. He's like, Hey, we're like brothers, right? Mm -hmm. My people, like your people. And he basically just kind of made this pact with them. He's just like, I'll go with you, we'll go off to battle. And it's very foolish, because King Ahab was wicked. And you don't ever want to be around people who are living and doing wickedly, because people are doing that, they're going to get the judgment of God come down upon them, and it doesn't matter if you're a righteous man, if you're a good man, hey, if you're hanging around with the wrong people, when God's judgment comes, you might just be collateral damage. And you need to make sure that you're aware of that. Now, that doesn't happen to Joshua in this story, but I'm just saying that, that keep this in mind. Okay, we're gonna see, we're gonna see what Joshua ends up reaping with making this affinity with King Ahab. But let's let's keep reading the story. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So Joshua, because he's a righteous man, he said, Hey, let's inquire of the Lord. Let's ask God, let's see what God has to say about this battle, because that's what the, a godly king was supposed to do. Before you go off to fight somebody, before you do anything, you're supposed to inquire of the Lord first and ask God, God, are you with us? Is this what we should be doing? Are we going to go off to battle? And this is, this is consistently what the good men of God would do. And God would tell them either, yes, you know, I've given them into your hand, or no, don't go out at this time. And we see King David did that all the time. David was always going to the Lord and inquiring God, God, should I go up against the Philistines? And, you know, are, are, you gonna, you know, are they going to deliver me into the hand of Saul? He was always, even before he was king, he was asking God, God, what should I do? Go to God first for direction, for guidance, for counsel. And uh, see, unfortunately, Jehoshaphat says, first, sure, I'll go to battle with you. And then he says, well, wait, we should go ask God. You know, let's inquire of the Lord. And let's see how this goes. It says, uh, verse number six, Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Joshua said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? Joshua sees these phonies, right? He's got these 400 phonies that are just like, yeah, go up. Yo, God's with you. God bless you, brother. Yo, you're living a great life. Hey, God is with us. Go on. God's going to deliver in your hand. And there's just these yes men that are just saying whatever the king wants to hear. They're tickling his ears, but they're not speaking what the Lord actually says. And there's so many people that call themselves prophets that are like that today. They're false prophets that, that are just preaching for filthy lucre's sake. They're preaching for, because they like the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jehoshaphat sees through this. He's like, wait, is there someone else we could ask about this? <laughs> It'd be like, you know, you get in a room and, and, uh, and you're, you're a general and you're about to go out to, to battle. And you're like, hey, you know, let's, let's ask God about this. And they bring in Joel Osteen and Rick Warren and all these other guys. And it's like, uh, yeah, is there someone else we could ask? Because <laughs> I'm not going to listen to these clowns. And so then they do it, verse 8, it says, And the king of Israel said unto Joshua, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Joshua said, Let not the king say so. So he's saying, There is this guy, Micaiah, but he's always preaching against me. He's always preaching evil against me. He's like, I don't like him at all. And Joshua's just like, Oh, don't say that. You know, I'm sure it's not that bad. 
And then in verse, jump down to verse 15. It says, uh, So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. So he just kind of repeats what the other guys were saying, and um, he's messing with them here. Verse 16, it says, And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And notice, the king didn't ask him what God said. He just said, Should we go? So my guy's like, Yeah, sure, go. You know, go and prosper. And the king's like, Look, tell me what God said. Don't just, you know, how many times do I have to tell you? Just tell me that which is true. Verse 17, it says, And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. So it's not good, it's not a good word from the Lord for Ahab. Because he's basically saying he's going to get killed. And he does. Ahab dies in this battle. And, and Ahab is so wicked. He, he actually, he goes in disguised as just like a regular common soldier. But Jehoshaphat, he sends out like in his royal apparel, you know, like as the king. And the king of Syria had made a commandment. He said, look, we're not going to fight. He told his troops, don't fight with the great or the small. Like, don't fight with anybody but with the king of Israel. That's who our enemy is. That's who we're going after. And that's who they wanted to focus on. So when they saw Jehoshaphat, they thought, this must be the king. Because they didn't know Jehoshaphat and, and Ahab yoked up together and everything else. So they start going after Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat yells out a scream, and, 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 you know, and God's with them. And then they realize, wait, this isn't Ahab. So then they back off from fighting Jehoshaphat because of their, their orders, their command was not to, to fight against anyone else. Even this king or this great man, you know, they needed to go after Ahab. That was what their commandments were. So, um, and Ahab actually just gets hit by some random arrow. So, some, you know, a man drew his bow at a venture. He just shot this, a guy on the other side. He shoots his arrow, not really knowing where it's going to go. Boom. Hits Ahab. Ahab ends up dying. And uh, what's really interesting about this story is that you know, nothing, Jehoshaphat made it out fine. Okay. Jehoshaphat, like I said, he was a godly man. He's a godly king. He's doing right by God. But he yoked up and joined up with this wicked king of Israel. And what's interesting about this story is in 2 Chronicles chapter 19, you don't have to turn, I'll read this for you. Stay in 2 Kings. We're going to go back. We're going to stay in 2 Kings. But in 2 Chronicles 19 verse 2, it says, And Jehu the son of Hanani the seer went out to meet him. And said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. The reason why it's interesting, now in context when you see it, we don't have time to get through all of it, but look it up later if you want, Second Chronicles 19. Jehoshaphat gets rebuked by God for helping Ahab. And... Think about who Joshua was helping here just for a second. And think about it in today's world. Joshua was, or I mean, G, uh, Ahab was the king of Israel, right? The nation of Israel. That's who Joshua was helping. Joshua was the king of Judah. He was helping the king of Israel. And what are we told today about Israel? Aren't we told that God's going to bless us if we go over there and help fight with Israel and help give them arms and help support them and get involved in all their conflicts against all these other wicked heathen nations and that we need to support Israel? This is what the drumbeat is in Christian churches today, saying we need to help Israel. God's going to bless us because he's going to bless us, bless those who bless Israel and all this other nonsense, right? Well, look. People get deceived by this because you hear it over and over again, and they like to rip verses out of context instead of even understanding and going back to, what about a story like this? See, what they'll tell you is that it's unconditional. Those promises are unconditional. You have to bless Israel all the time, no matter what. Is that the truth? Absolutely not. Because it is conditional whether or not you should be blessing a nation. Jehoshaphat did exactly what Christian churches today are telling us to do with modern day Israel and to go and to help them and to fight for them and to be with them and to be their ally so God will bless us. 
Was Jehoshaphat blessed by God by going and fighting in this, in this war with Ahab? No. He was rebuked by God. 2 Chronicles 19.2, I'll read it again. It says, Jehu, the son of an Anani seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore, so because of this, because of what you did, is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. God's wrath is resting on you, Jehoshaphat, because you helped the ungodly, wicked nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, does Israel today, is it a godly nation that serves the Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. They are not. Now, does that mean there's nobody saved in Israel? No, there's, there's a remnant. There is a small amount of people who are believers. And I believe it's like that pretty much everywhere in the world. You'll have believers in some places. But by and large, Israel is not is not a godly nation. They are not worshiping and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. They reject the Lord Jesus Christ. That is an antichrist in a wicked nation as a whole that is rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. So if wrath was upon Jehoshaphat, doesn't it make sense that if we go and get ourselves involved as supposedly Christian, godly, you know, upstanding people like Jehoshaphat was. Jehoshaphat was a Christian. He was a good man. He was a man of God who followed the ways of the Lord. But he yoked up with this wicked king and this wicked nation that was serving false gods. They worshipped Baal. And he got wrath, the wrath of God, upon him. The wrath of God is going to be upon us as well. Now, we have lots of reasons these days for the wrath of God to be upon our nation. We don't need to keep adding fuel to the fire by yoking up with this nation of Israel and helping them to fight their battle. We need to stay out of it and let the wicked heathen nations fight amongst themselves, whether it be a Muslim nation, whatever. Any of those wicked heathens, look, let them destroy themselves. It's none of our business. We don't need to be going over there and getting involved in all their conflicts, especially when we're helping out someone who's wicked. We're going to get the wrath of God on us. God doesn't change. Now look, it would be a different story. If Israel today were like a lighthouse of Christianity, if, Israel, if, if you could go to Jerusalem and like, man, there's Christian churches everywhere. This is like the national religion is that, that people worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Then yeah, that would be different. Then I would say, sure, yeah, let's help them. Let's, let's, let's be allies with them because they're Christian, because they're serving the Lord. And then those blessings of God, I believe, would be there. Yeah, we'd be blessed for blessing them and cursed for cursing them if they were doing right by the Lord, if they were following His ways and obeying Him. But that's not the case today. And people need to wake up to that fact. Now, uh, I want to get... I'm really, really, really far behind on, on where I wanted to be, but let's keep going here. Uh, this isn't the only time that Jehoshaphat teams up with the wicked ruler of Israel. So after Ahab, his son reigns in his stead, his son Jehoram. Um, we're in, you're in 2 Kings, right? Flip back to chapter number 3. Second Kings chapter number 3. Look at verse number 5 of chapter 3. It says, But it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So now, instead of Syria, now it's a different enemy. Now it's Moab. Moab rebels, and it says in verse 6, And king Jehoram went out of Samaria at the same time and numbered all Israel. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horse as thy horse. It's the same exact answer that he gave unto Ahab. He gives now unto his son, Jehoram. He says, look, my people are as thy people. So he goes and gets involved in another conflict. Now, again, I'm not going to go through all the places, um, but Jehoshaphat is another wicked king. You're in, let's jump down to verse number 11, because Jehoshaphat asks the same thing, then to inquire of the Lord, as he did before. And let's see how this turns out. Verse 11. But Joshua said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? 
And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. So this is a really great man of God, right, Elisha? It's a good man to be asking. Verse 12, it says, And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Now, that response by Elisha unto the king of Israel is the same response that Jehoshaphat should have had unto the king of Israel. And said, get you to the prophets of your father and your mother and you know, fight your own stinking battles yourself and get right with God. That's what Jehoshaphat should have done to him instead of saying, no, you know, we're like brothers and I'm going to go and just fight for you even though you're wicked and even though you're worshiping a false god. Verse 14 says, And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. Elisha saying, The only reason you're even getting to hear from me at all is because Jehoshaphat's a good man. And I am here for the benefit of Jehoshaphat, not for you. And that speaks a lot, too, to Jehoshaphat, that, again, he was a good man. And we don't, I don't want to lose focus of this, okay? As we're, we're digging into this one big problem that he had, we don't want to lose focus of the fact that Joshua was a really good man. He's a really good king. And, and, you know, all of his days, he didn't cease from following the Lord. He did that which was right. And that, that's all the more reason why I'm pointing out this one flaw is because you can be living a very good life, a very godly life, but if you have one area that's wrong, something like this, if you, if you start joining up with wicked people, it's going to have a negative consequence on you. We're almost getting to that consequence now. So this time, God actually gives them the victory over Moab. Okay, Jehoram doesn't die in this battle like Ahab died in the other one. And um, they actually defeat the enemy, okay? But, but whether you win the battle or not does not mean it's right for you to be yoking up with wicked people, okay? And we're going we're gonna to see the consequences of his actions soon. So after Jehoram dies, Jehoshaphat's still king. So Jehoshaphat's king during Ahab's reign, reign, during the reign of his son Jehoram, and then during the reign of his son Ahaziah. So there's, there's, there's Ahab, Jehoram, and Ahaziah, and Joshua's king, because he's king for a long time, like 35 years. So during these years, these three kings of Israel come up, and they're all wicked. And, and Joshua yokes up with all three of them. He has more dealings with them. Look at, um, yeah, let's flip over to 2 Chronicles, because we're going to look. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We've got another reference in 2 Chronicles, and then we're going to finish up the story of Joshua. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 35. We're going to see here how Jehoshaphat yokes up then with Ahaziah. It says, and after this, in Second Chronicles 20, 35, and after this did Jehoshaphat king of Judah join himself with Ahaziah king of Israel who did very wickedly. And he joined himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made the ships in Ezion Geber. Then Eliezer, or then Eliezer, the, the son of Dodabab, Marisha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because thou hast joined thyself with Ahaziah, the Lord hath broken thy works, and the ships were broken, that they were not able to go to Tarshish. The only preaching we see against Jehoshaphat is always because he's yoking up with these wicked kings of Israel. And it's his wicked family of Ahab. Overall, Jehoshaphat did right. He followed the Lord. He's a good, righteous man. He's a good Christian man. But... He made this friendship with the house of Ahab. He made this alliance. And it didn't seem to have very much impact personally on his life while he was alive. It didn't seem to, to you know, we don't get that anywhere from scripture that, that he was necessarily affected personally himself. But look at what happens at, at the impact that it actually had to his children. 
2 Chronicles 21. Look at chapter 21 and verse number 1. It says, Now Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Jehoram his son reigned in his set. Now, this is where the book of Kings and Chronicles will get confusing because you have Jehoram the son of Jehoshaphat and you have Jehoram the son of, a of um, Ahab. And it could get a little bit confusing because they have the same name. And, and as you're reading, you're like, wait, which one am I talking about? So you have to really keep close eye on the Israel versus um, Judah. But anyways... So he has a son, and he names his son Jehoram. And his, it, Jehoram reigns in his stead. Look at verse number 2. It says, and he had brethren, the sons of Jehoshaphat. So now it's going to list off Jehoshaphat's other sons. Azariah, and Jehiel, and Zechariah, and Azariah, and Michael, and Shephatiah. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. And their father gave them great gifts of silver and of gold and of precious things with fenced cities in Judah. But the kingdom gave you to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. So he takes care of all of his kids. He gives them riches. He, you know, he helps them out. But he's like, well, Jehoram was the firstborn, so he's going to reign in my stead. Just because he's the firstborn. Like, that is his firstborn right. Verse number four says, now when Jehoram was risen up to the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and slew all his brethren with the sword. And divers also the princes of Israel. He killed his own brothers. He killed all, because anyone else who would have claim to the throne, he killed them all. He killed his own, so Jehoshaphat's, all Jehoshaphat's children, all of his sons, end up dying at the hands of his son Jehoram, who's done wickedly. That's a horrible thing to happen to Jehoshaphat after being such a godly man and righteous man of God, right? Why did all this happen? Well, let's keep reading. Verse number 5. Jehoram was 32 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, like as did the house of Ahab. Why? For he had the daughter of Ahab to wife, and he wrought that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. If King Jehoshaphat had not been joining up and making a league and making teams up with Ahab and going and hanging out with Ahab and going and saying, sure, my people are like thy people, and saying this to this wicked king, there's no way his son would have married Ahab's daughter. There's no way. Ahab in a wicked house, God wiped off the house of Ahab from the face of this earth. Ahab, Jezebel, the dogs licked their blood. They had great curses against them for the wickedness that they did. And Je Jehoshaphat still decided to be friends with them, to speak kindly to them, to, to, to talk to them, saying, hey, we're, we're brothers, man. Of course, I'm right there with you. Wrong. That had such dire consequences on Jehoshaphat's family. Now, maybe it didn't affect him personally, with his walk with God. It could have. You start teaming up with wicked people, guess what? They're going to start to rub off on you. But even if you are, you know, such a great, strong man of God, and you're able to do that which is right, maybe Joshua was like that, but what about his son? What about all of his sons? Look at what happened. All of his sons died except for wicked Jehoram, then wicked Jehoram was killed. Very shortly very shortly after he came into power, because his heart was turned wicked by his wife, which was of that family, Ahab's family. Very, very, very important. This, and this is the point of the sermon. I really wanted to go in depth on this life because you can have a lot of good things going for you. You can be, you know, you can have a lot of sin out of your life. You could be living for God. You could be in church. You could be doing right in the eyes of God. But some of these things, you know, who you keep company with, who you decide to spend your time with, and, and, and who you speak nicely about and nicely to, and instead of hating the wickedness and, and calling it what it is, you know, when you start to invite this stuff into your life and you start to bring this, this influence around, hey, even if it doesn't affect you, what about your children? What about others that are looking to you? 
This is a serious price that Jehoshaphat ended up paying, even if he didn't see it in his lifetime. Horrible events happen, and, it's, and it all stems from his relationship with Ahab, and his son, and his son. Those three wicked kings. If he would not have joined up with them, then I do not believe that things would have turned out this way, because he, could have, you know, he would have taught his son, no, the house of Ahab is wicked, you stay away from them. You're not going to marry their daughter. You have nothing to do with that family. I don't think his heart would have been turned the way it was. Because if he, if the Bible tells us in verse 6, it says, For, that means because he had the daughter of Ahab to wife. That's why he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He was hanging out with them. I mean, when you marry someone, you're, you're hanging out with them. You get to know them. He's hanging, spending time around their family. And he's learning all their wickedness. The gods that they serve, everything else. And he wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord. Um, there's another, one of the sons of David, I don't want to get into this too much, but turn if you would to 2 Samuel, we'll read real briefly what happens here. I want to bring this up. Um, why we need to be so careful, and I could spend an entire sermon on this story as well. But David had a son named Amnon, and we're going to see a little bit about him in 2 Samuel 13. We see the influence of a bad friend. Allowing a wicked friend in your life can have devastating consequences. And I don't care how you know the person. I don't care if you knew him in your past. I don't care if it's a friend of the family or whatever. When someone has this type of wickedness, when they're that, like, like Ahab, was, Ahab was, was extremely wicked. Okay, this is not someone who's just a sinner. You know, like people will try to say, oh, well, you know, Jesus hung out with the, with the harlots and the publicans and the sinners. Yeah, he ate with them, and he gave them the gospel and tried to get them saved. Okay? They weren't his best buddies, but he didn't just completely shut them. But the, your average sinner, your publican, your harlot, whatever, that's not your King Ahab. King Ahab, it says he did, that's why I, I stress to point that out, he did wicked Unlike any of the other kings of Israel, Israel had done. He was, he was a murderous man, a covetous man, and worshipped his false gods. He, he had, and he caused a lot of people to sin. And um, he was an extremely wicked man. Those are not the type of people that you need to be making friends with or even dealing with kindly so that your children can see them. Like, oh, well, he's doing all this stuff that's wicked, that's against God, but I guess it's still okay for dad to go and... and and buddy up with them and get involved with them and team up with them for different things, you know? No. Um, 2 Samuel 13, look at verse number 1. We're going to see Amnon. It says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. So this is Absalom's sister, Tamar. They had a... Um, they were born of one wife of David, and then Amnon was the son of another of David's wives. And this is one of the problems with having multiple wives. Anyways, but anyways, so Amnon falls in love with Tamar, his, sis, his half-sister, right? Look at verse 2. It says, And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. So at this point, Amnon's just like, well, she's my sister. You know, I can't do anything. She's my sister. But he's so much in love with her. He's just, just sick and love with her. Like, man, I just love her so much. And it's it just kind of grieving him. But it said, you know, the Bible saying he said, I th he just, it thought it hard for him to do anything. He's not going to act on anything. Look at what it says in verse three. But Amnon had a friend. So next words. Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. Now that word subtle in the Bible, do you, do you recognize that word being used for, to describe someone else? When I talk about the snake in the, in the Garden of Eden, that the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field. Jonadab was a very subtle man. He's a wicked man, a wicked friend of Amnon. Look at what he does. Verse 4, it says, And he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, Lean from day to day. Now this, this sounds exactly what Jezebel said unto Ahab. Why, yo, you're the king. Why are you sad when he wanted Naboth's vineyard? 
He says, Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it, and eat it at her hand. So he comes, he devises this scheme, right? He devises this scheme, and says, okay, here's what you do. Pretend like you're sick. And then, tell, and then tell David, your father, tell him, hey, send Tamar to bring me some food and, and to feed it to me. So he gets her alone in his bedroom with Tamar. And then, of course, the next thing that happens, he ends up defiling her, forcing her, and then he hates her. All of this, now, he wasn't going to do anything before, but you see how his wicked friend come, concocts this plan and he listens to this wicked friend, and then he ends up committing a horrible act of forcing his sister, and then thrusting her out, and just disgracing and shaming her, and he ends up dying at the hands of Absalom, because Absalom remembers what he did to his sister, and he ends up killing him. But um, the influence of that wicked friend took a man who, who hadn't really done anything bad, hadn't done anything wrong, yeah, he was in love with his sister, and, and you know what, maybe he shouldn't have been, okay? But until his friend got involved, he wasn't planning on doing anything. He thought it, you know, he, he thought it hard to do anything to her, is what the Bible says, and I believe the Bible's true. Wicked people, wicked friends can have a really bad impact on your life. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 20, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Who you keep company with, who you are companion with, who you walk with. Hey, you want to be wise? Walk with wise men. Get yourself around godly people. You want to be godly? Get yourself in church. Get yourself around godly people. Make those your friends. If that's the direction you want to go, if you want to be a fool, then go ahead and just make yourselves friends with the fools of the earth and you'll be just like them. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 24, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Who you're friends with are the, are the, the people whose ways you're going to learn. We need to be very, very careful that we choose our friends wisely. That we don't allow the Ahabs and the... Um, What's that guy's name? Um, Jonadab. The Jonadabs. Amna, um, Amnon's friend. The Ahabs, the Jonadabs, we don't want them in your, in your life. They're going to they're gonna rub off on you. They're gonna, you're going to learn their ways and you're going to get a snare to your soul. Be very careful who you choose to be friends with. The Bible says in James 4.4, 4, a, uh, a very famous verse, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now let's talk about the world in general. You're a friend of the world. But look, you ought not to have worldly friends. You're a friend of the world. If you're you know, involved in everything that this world has to offer and just, and just all of your interests and all your time to spend the things of this world, you're an enemy of God. If that's who you make your friendship... Be very careful who you make your friends with. We, we don't want to... I've got a lot more that I could cover, but we've kind of run out of time. Um, let's go to one more in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Because I don't want to... I don't want to just... I want to at least get to this point. Um, the Bible warns us about specific people. I want to get specific... The Bible gets specific in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Because you, you can say, well, Pastor Burson, as you said before, you know, Jesus was um, hung out with sinners. He, you know, he, he, he ate with, with publicans and harlots and all these other things. And yeah, he did. But does that mean that they were his personal friends and that he, he spent all his time with them every day? No. No. And that's, and that's a big distinction to make is that... Hey, when I see someone on the street or when, I, when, I, you know, when I'm going around town... I'm going to try to share the gospel with people. I don't care. I mean, if they're a real bad sinner, hey, they need the gospel. 
right? I mean, they need the gospel just like anyone else does. Because whether you're a really big sinner or a small sinner, hey, it all deserves hell. And if you don't have Christ as your Savior, that's where you're going to go, regardless of the amount of sins that you've done. So, yeah, he preached the gospel to them. I'll do the same thing. I'll, I'll go out and get a bite to eat with, with someone who's unsaved. I'll try to give them the gospel, but I'll tell you what, that's not going to be my best friends. That's not going to be who I'm going to be spending my time with um, you know, re on a regular basis. Just, yeah. just this is who my best friend is. This is my best buddy. They're, they're worldly. They're unsaved. But I'm Christian, and I'm, and I'm a man of God, and I'm going to do what's right by God, but this is my best friend. No. Um, the Bible gets very specific in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse number 9. And Paul kind of explains this here. He says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. People going out and having relations outside of marriage before they're married. He says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for they must ye needs go out of the world. He's saying, look, when I said this, I wasn't just talking about like any, every single person who's covetous or extortioner or idolater. He says, you'd have to go out of the world to be away from those people. You just have to be all by yourself and secluded. He says, I'm not saying that. He says, but now I've written unto you not to keep company. So again, friends, right? Not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one no not to eat. Now, should we be making friends with, with people in church or people who are godly people? Yes. But if the person is called a brother and they've been in church and they, and they meet the fit the bill on one of these things, he says, don't even go out to eat with them. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. You don't want to get near the person who's, who's in a sin like this that supposedly, you know, saved and been in church and is called a brother. When they're, when they're getting into sins like this, when they're getting into fornication, when they're getting into idolatry and covetousness, you don't want that to rub off on you. And you don't want to make them think that what they're doing is okay by spending your time with them. It's a twofold application here. One is you don't want that getting on you. You don't want them to, to influence you and yourself, but at the same time, you don't want them thinking they're okay, which is one of the problems with Jehoshaphat. Ahab didn't seem to think there was any problems with what he was doing since the godly man Jehoshaphat was joining him with battle to fight his battles with him. Ahab could have used a little, you know, from Jehoshaphat saying, no, I ain't, I'm not going to go fight with you. You're wicked. You need to get right with God. Maybe he needed to hear that from Jehoshaphat. Who knows? Maybe Ahab would have gotten right with God before that if Jehoshaphat would have said something like that. I don't know. You don't know either. We don't know. But Jehoshaphat didn't do that, so no one will ever know. Sometimes people need to hear things like that, and, and especially coming from someone who's godly. I mean, Jehoshaphat, he was a mighty king, and it, it went off. The first chapter that we read goes into detail on he had, you know, 200,000 men under this captain, 200,000 under this one, 400,000. He had a lot, of, a lot of valiant, mighty men of war. So he was a good force. He didn't have to go and, and help King Ahab. He, could have, he was fine on his own. And now I'm not saying that that would have been an excuse to go and help him anyways. No excuse to go help the wicked. Even under threat, it's not an excuse. I'm just saying that, that I mean, he, was, he had no reason whatsoever to even justify what he did. He was a wicked man. And uh, we need to, to be careful of who we keep our company with, who we make our friends. We don't want to have these wicked curses coming upon our life, these, these, these horrible things happening as a result of who we choose to be close with and who we choose to make ties with. And, and um, you know, we saw two examples of I of Jehoshaphat and Amnon. Jehoshaphat was that main one because he was such a good, godly man. So don't ever think... You know, let him that, that think that he stand and take heed lest he fall, the Bible says. Because you can think you've got all these things going on in your life, but one, one slip up, one mistake, one error can cause you quite a bit. And this is the one thing that we're focusing on today is our, is our life, our personal friendships with people. It doesn't mean you don't, you don't you have to cut off all contact altogether with anyone who's not you know, on fire serving the Lord. 
But who are your friends? Who are you spending time with? And who are you endorsing? Joshua endorsed the wicked man by going to fight his battle with him. That's a strong, that's a solid endorsement. And to be honest with you, that's one of the reasons why I don't endorse any political candidates because, in my opinion, they're all wicked. I have not met one Christian man that, that is a godly man that, that I can say, I endorse this person to, to, to be a judge or a ruler in our nation. Because they're all covetous. They're all, they all have their own agendas. And I don't want to send any wrong messages to my children thinking that, oh, well, here's dad. He preaches against, you know, this sin or that sin. Yet he's endorsing this man and he's campaigning for him and he's fighting his battles when they're a wicked person. Won't do it. I won't do it. I don't want that to happen and get that confusion in their minds what obviously happened in Jehoram's mind. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the Bible. God, I pray that you would please give us wisdom to, um, to choose our friends wisely. Lord, help us to, um, to make sure that, that we have a, a proper disgust and hatred for sin and wickedness, dear Lord, that we wouldn't allow ourselves to just compromise and, and to... to have good relations with people who are extremely wicked like Ahab was. God, I pray that you would please just, just strengthen us, strengthen our church, dear Lord, and um, help our children to also to, to grow close to you and have their own um, solid relationship with you, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.